thank you very much for joining us, um, Mr. Arnaud. I suppose we should start at the beginning um, with your, your sort please, of... Please call, call me Alexandre. Alexandre, uh, yeah. perfect. Um, at the beginning with your sort of family and, and, and upbringing. Um, as the son of Bernard Arnaud and then your mum's a uh, gifted pianist and, and a top athlete, um, you had a sort of very, well, one might say, un unconventional and very privileged background. Is the reality more, more nuanced? Um, is there anything that's under, misunderstood about your upbringing and what shaped you going forwards um, because of your family life? Sure. Um, first, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, at, at Oxford tonight. Um, you mentioned, yes, I was very lucky, obviously, and, and um, I think one of the things that um, is very important with my upbringing is um, the values that were given to me, you know, values of family, values of work, values of merit. Nothing was granted. Um, everything was always earned, whether it was through school, through sports, through music, through achievements in, in, in a way which I think are foundational to everyone's education today, ex in, including mine, you know, and I think that's what makes the beauty of the group as well. The LVMH group is a family group, and the first most important value is definitely family. And uh, you know, if any of you work for LVMH or have or want to work for LVMH, that's sort of what you'll feel um, by joining the company is that yes, it's a, a publicly traded company that's very big with a lot of employees, but in the end, it's a family that's represented by, by our family. And, uh, and that was the biggest value that was transmitted to me, which, which I you know, hopefully will transmit to my own children as well. And that sort of upbringing of everything must be earned and the sort of certain expectations, did you feel like there was pressure put on you to sort of follow in your father's footsteps or indeed your mother's footsteps in either the corporate or musical worlds? So there's never official pressure, you know, when, when it's always like, oh, you can do whatever you want, of course, but when the, when the moment comes, I guess you feel the pressure. Um, uh, one, one of the things that I like to say is that I've, I feel like I've been in an MBA since I'm born, you know, because... <laughs> Um, every lunch or dinner conversation is, is probably about the business and uh, it's, it's a great chance because obviously I, I learned a lot and the group was made, you know, since the, the 80s. I was born in 92, so I kind of could have seen it through its, its inception and its creation, which, which um, is a huge advantage uh, to understand the market better. So, you know, there is pressure, of course, but it's, it's also only if I meet the expectations. So it's... it's uh, that, that's how it's measured. Do you think having that family connection with the company has changed how you've worked and how you view your job in the various parts of LVMH that you've worked in? Um, of course. So being uh, younger than most executives, you know, I think this uh, MBA since I'm born that I've been talking about has, is definitely something that um, gave me competitive advantage to understand the luxury market, the luxury industry from a very young age. So that's, you know, I wouldn't have that, would not have had that um, had I not been a part of the family, which uh, is great. And I think then also, you know, people are very respectful um, of, of the family and of, of what we do to the group. So I think two things. One, meritocracy is key. So, you know, nothing, uh, nothing is taken for granted. For example, you know, when I, when I started running Ramoa, it was... Um, kind of a coincidence, to, to be fair. I, I found the company, I started to lead the acquisition process, and um, I wasn't at all going to work there. And the, the uh, former owner and CEO said, you know, I'll only sell the company if you become co-CEO next to me. So then, you know, I was 23 years old, 24 years old. I said, okay, wow, I have to move to Germany. I had not planned this at all. It kind of came this way, you know. So, so um, meritocracy is very important uh, within the group, so you know, you'll never see us, uh, when I say us, is my siblings and myself kind of like jump from a position to another with, with no uh, earned, and then nothing earned, I mean. And then two, I think what's also super important as, as being part of the family is respect. Um, we're, we're, you know, a very respectful uh, organization of people's careers, people's developments, and, and that was definitely taught to me from, from a very young age. You said that LVMH is a very sort of family-oriented company, and Ramoa, who you, as you said, mentioned you were co-CEO of, was also a family business before yep. um, LVMH acquired it. Um, the number of family businesses have been going down over the years, and now only 10% of family businesses make it to third generation. Do you think there is something inherently beneficial in a company being a family business? 
I mean, I, yes, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, of course, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's extremely beneficial for, for a few things. You know, I was, I was mentioning to one of your colleagues today that I, I was um, with a, a few private equity folks right before, before coming here who have a very different vision of how they, they view business, right? They, they, and, you know, private equity is a great industry. I was working in there before, but they acquire businesses with the mindset of turning them around quickly and selling them. What we do as a family company and what I've seen in mo most family companies like Ramoa, for example, is very long-term thinking. And we always like to say that we never think of um, what we do for the next quarter, for the next year, for the next five years, but for the next 50 years, you know? And, and every decision we make, um, some of them, you know, I, I think we're gonna talk about later, uh, are not necessarily, or often never financially driven, but they're always driven towards desirability of the brand, you know? So I was, I was hearing you talk about Beyonce and Jay-Z earlier before I came in. Um, you know, we made that decision at the very beginning uh, uh, of Tiffany when the world was always still locked down and, and we weren't seeing the end of it, but you know, we thought, hey, why, why not try and do this, which will hopefully drive desirability for the next 10, 15, 20 years for the brand, which it's easy to say now it was successful, right? But back then, you know, it's, it's sort of things that you can do in a family business that you can't do in a publicly traded company that's not controlled, that has to deliver quarterly earnings or, you know, things like that. So I think for that, family businesses are, are very valuable. And then being a part of a family is also very important uh, for, for people who work for us. You know, I think there's 160,000 people working at LVMH today, which is big, but, you know, they, they feel as part of the family, can move from a brand to another. And, and it's, it's, you can't find that in, in, in other places, in, in my view. What do you attribute the decrease the number of family businesses to in the sort of global business world? It's tough. I don't know. I think uh, you've seen a lot of examples of families that have fought, families that haven't uh, understood how to work with each other. And, and I think it all comes from the founder and then how it's all done uh, in the next generations to make sure that everybody gets along, everybody has a clear set of responsibilities. And you know, what I was mentioning to you, like meritocracy and, and earning your way in and, and proving yourself or sometimes working outside is very important to kind of start learning and, and make sure that all the decisions you make are for the business first and, and for yourself. I think that's the, the few examples I can think of of family businesses that weren't successful, didn't follow these rules. Going back to yourself, you said you had this sort of MBA since birth um, style of, of upbringing and education, and yet you went on to do a degree in, in science, in computer science. What was the motivating factor behind that if you'd sort of already clocked in your head that you wanted to go into business? So a few things. Um, number one, I think in France, um, every country has its different perspective on studies in France. Engineering is often perceived as the most prestigious studies you could do. And I don't know if some of you are familiar with the French uh, school system, but it's all anonymous. Like when you do what you call a classe préparatoire, you go there and you're with whatever, 10,000 people and your name doesn't matter, it, it, everything's blanked out. So whatever success you have is really up to what you've done, what you've learned and what you've studied. So it was very important to me coming from you know, the family that I have with my last name to do something that I could do on my own, right? That I couldn't buy, that nobody could pay for, that, that was just fully linked to my studies, my work, my rigor, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why, why I did that, for sure. Then also I thought that, you know, I was always interested in math and, and like science, so it was definitely something that I was interested in studying, and the business studies per se, I didn't feel like could give me as much as science because, as I told you, I was, I was shown to business very early on. So linking that in with some of the decisions you've since made um, in, in businesses and Tiffany's marketing since you took over um, as the EVP um, has been full of very bold statements with like a, a, a yellow store, crypto punks, TIFF coins um, and then the, the, some of the campaigns that you've launched. Um, has this partly been driven by your scientific education or is it instead, as you said, driven by this desire to make uh, the brand continually desirable in 10, 20, 50 years time? A bit of both, you know, I mean, obviously crypto isn't necessarily something that's uh, embraced by a lot of executives uh, in luxury today. So I was lucky to be shown to that world very early and, and very interested. So that's why we started doing little things in that space. 
I think the, the, um, the science upbringing gave me more kind of the, the rigor and the way of working more than like the inspiration to do these things. So it was definitely more uh, desirability driven for sure. Um, and, and kind of like when we bought the company, which is um, a year and a half ago already, um, you know, we did an assessment pretty quickly of, of its strength, its weaknesses, like, you know, you've learned this many times. Um, and, and marketing was kind of the easy pillar, the first easy pillar that you could actionate because in, in these businesses, I always say there's three levers that you can work on, which is one, the stores, two, the product, and three, the marketing. You know, there's 350 stores at Tiffany, so renovating everything or changing everything takes five years, you know, it's, it's very capital intensive, labor intensive. Product, it's not like fashion. Fashion, you bring in a designer, there's a new collection and things change. Jewelry, you know, you need to buy stones and make molds and buy gold and it takes minimum two years to really launch something. So marketing was the first thing that we could do. Um, and, and we really saw that the brand um, was so powerful. You know, I, at Remoa in the US, the, when I joined the company, the awareness, so if you take 100 people and you put them in a the room and you ask them, do you know Remoha? Two of them would say yes, 98 would say no. When I left, five people would say yes, 95 would say no. So people were like, wow, it grew so fast and everything. At Tiffany, if you take 100 people in a room, 99.5% of these people know the brand. You know? So it's a very, very different scale. Um, and, and it's so strong in people's minds that you could actionate marketing really easily in a way to rejuvenate it and to take risks that had never been taken before. Um, as well as those bold statements that I mentioned, you've also been known for all the culture-led collaborations, including the Jay-Z and um, Beyonce one I mentioned, but also under the Supreme and Off-White, um, Patek Philippe. Do you, some of these have been quite controversial, including your Not Your Mother's Tiffany campaign. Does all of this link back to a belief that all publicity is good publicity. So I don't say I don't think all publicity is, is good publicity. You know, there's uh, especially today with social networks, uh, it's very difficult uh, to have an authentic and organic message to share. And you see a lot of things that are uh, not successful at all. People get criticized and a lot of bashing and everything that can really ruin brands, right? So we're very cautious with what we do. Um, you're mentioning Not Your Mother's Tiffany. I was looking into the numbers uh, two days ago, actually, and, and our silver business grew the fastest in five years the month of that campaign. So it was probably controversial, but, you know, it had a great impact on sales, which is, which is in the end, what we look for. So with those collaborations, what's important to us, and obviously you see a lot of brands that are doing collaboration after collaboration, which are good or bad, you don't know, but we're really trying to be as authentic as we can. And, and you know, I'll just take one example, which is Supreme. A lot of brands now say, oh, we have to target millennials, and they make these matrices, matrices of saying, hey, what are the brands that talk to millennials? They have a list, and they say, okay, we're going to do Supreme to tick a box of millennials. And, and you know, those recipes can work really well. That's just not what we do. We, we actually took a call from Supreme, and then they called us and at Remoa, and we said, okay, They've never done bags before. They talk to a street skate culture that we like. Let's do something that's super authentic with them. And then it ends up targeting millennials, but it's never done kind of a, in a marketing way, but more in a very authentic and organic way, which leads to you know, selling out and hopefully success. So with both of those moves, the Not Your Mother campaign and targeting brands like uh, Supreme, or not targeting, but working with brands like Supreme, um, some critics have argued that you are targeting this sort of new um, base of customers and in, in, in turn sacrificing some of your loyal, long-term, older customers. Um, do you think that this is a fair criticism? And do you think it is a um, sort of approach that all luxury brands need to take at some stage to risk themselves becoming outdated? So uh, I, I don't think it's fair um, <laughs> for, for, for a few reasons. One, um, the Supreme collaboration that we did was probably the time where I had the most surprising people call me to get a suitcase. You know, they were old and not at all working in, in design, luxury or anything. So it shows that, you know, even with these kinds of products, you can reach people that are not necessarily, you know, the average skateboarder with its hoodie or something that, that you're, you're looking for. Um, 
obviously we're never going to try to alienate anyone from our, our customer base, which is why we're trying to do things at different scales, you know, and, and if I take Ramoa or Tiffany, we're working with contemporary artists or Supreme. We're working with very known brands like Dior or, you know, Virgil Abloh or things like that. So we really try to do everything we can. That being said, I think, I always forget the number, we think it's 64% of the world is below 40 in age, right? So they, all their consumption is ahead of them. And 92% of these people are connected uh, somehow to the internet. So it's, it's definitely these people that are the future of what we're doing. So in my view, it's not alienating yourselves, the old customers to the new customers and you know, taking a few shortcuts to what your question was, but it's more about how to be relevant with this consumer base who's not necessarily your target consumer base now so that when they become the target consumer base, they think of you and other, other brands, right? And by doing that, still talking to the customers that are existing today. And one of the things behind Not Your Mother's Tiffany campaign is also that, hey, a lot of mothers want to look like their daughters too, right? So if, if they want to be cool like their daughters or things like that. So by targeting younger people, you also get to their parents. Do you think it's a frequent and long-term problem that luxury brands have is that they tend to be associated with wealthier and older people and that over time that can sort of lead to them dying out and fading into irrelevance? For sure, for sure. I think, you know, one, one thing that you're mentioning is wealth. Obviously, um, I always like to say I don't like the word, the word luxury because it's too linked to price. And, you know, you go to Tiffany, you can spend 180 pounds and you can get something great made by hand in the U.S. with a great packaging that gets you into the brand, you know. You can argue 180 pounds is, is a lot of money for sure, but, you know, not close to the $5,000 you would find at, at, at other brands uh, uh, as a starting price. So I don't think price is an issue to me. You're, or a bottle of Moet champagne for 30 euros, um, what is a brand we own too. That's a product that's made with great craft, with you know uh, amazing attention to detail, uh, and it's a luxury product in my end. So I do think that it is linked to what you're saying. However, you know, as long as you maintain relevance and you're able to stay culturally relevant to today's world, I don't see the brands is extinguishing any time. Do you think that the there's an interesting point with, with Tiffany there about the lower end sort of I, I items that you, that you sell going all the They're way They're not up low end. Not low end, sorry, sorry low, low price, low, low price fair, fair enough. Um, going all the way up to sort of tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds, pieces of diamond jewellery. Do you think that by having such a large price spectrum, you debase the luxuriness of the top price end products? I think so, because we try to be super accessible. You know, we want to be a place where everybody can get in the store and find something for themselves. I like to say you can go in and spend 200, 2,000, 20,000, 200,000, 2 million, 20 million. Name one brand where you have such an array of, of, of spend. There's not that many that I can think of, you know, and so a lot of people tell me the stories, so it's, it's now under construction, but that when they visit New York, the first stop they make is the Tiffany store on 57 and 5th of Audrey Hepburn. And one of the, the key things, the key attributes of the brand is its accessibility. A lot of luxury stores can feel very um, scary or very obnoxious. You know, hopefully in our group, we try not to do that, but, but I've, I've definitely felt like this before. And at Tiffany, we try to do the exact opposite. Everyone's welcome, whether they're spending, you know, 200 to 20 million pounds. And, and that's one of the greatest characteristics of the brand. So, um, yeah, it's really what we're trying to build. Focusing back on um, you, obviously going, back, going from being a co-CEO of Remoa, which is a um, multi-hundred million pound company, to being um, EVP at Tiffany, um, a much bigger company, would have been a bit of a, a shift. How did your experience as president of Remoa um, prepare you for the challenge of, of working in Tiffany? Uh, two different businesses, uh, you know, from suitcases to diamonds, so it has nothing to do with each other. But um, I think being, being CEO of, of Remoa for, for, I think it was four, four, five, four years, um, taught me a few things. One is, is uh, entrepreneurship, taking decisions and being accountable for the decisions you make. You know, I was discussing with, with someone right before. Um, uh, I, I worked at McKinsey, you know, I was a consultant and it was great experience, but I was helping people make decisions. I was not making the decisions myself. Um, making decisions per se is definitely something that uh, was extremely insightful. 
um, and, and you know, where kind of you're on the line. Like whatever you do, you're responsible, you're accountable. And at Tiffany is the same thing, you know, whether it's uh, deciding to press play on Not Your Mother's Tiffany or Beyonce or whatever crypto punks we're, we're doing, those things then are out in the world and it, you're, you're, you're accountable for them. So I think the decision making process was definitely something that, that the first thing that um, Ramoa learned, taught me. Um, building a team also is the first thing I did when I was at, at Ramoa is like how to build a world-class executive team to help me in different areas. Um, Tiffany, same thing, you know, we went out to build a completely revamped team of, of talents that uh, we believed could help us take the brand to where it was supposed to go. And then three is long-term, you know, again, back to this family thing, you know, um, Remo and Tiffany were two different companies. Remo was a family business, so it was already operating on a super long-term uh, vision. So when I came, I kind of perpetrated this tradition. Tiffany was a um, uncontrolled, publicly traded company that was taking decisions on a quarterly basis, you know, for the stock price. And so we, we you know, the CEO and myself really tried to uh, stop those uh, decision-making processes to make them much more long-term, even if that meant much more investment, um, year one, year two, year three, which, you know, will kind of not be great for profits in the first year, but in the end will be super beneficial to the brand and the customers. That shift also saw you go from being co-CEO to, to EVP. Have you felt there's been a loss of your individual agency and all your ability to make decisions as part of that? No, no not at all, because you know, there was 3,000 people at Remoa, 15,000 at Tiffany, so it's a, a very different scale. And uh, I'm, I'm very, you know, we, we, I, I view today work as being really team work whether you're a CEO or EVP or whatever you do, you know, we have at Tiffany today, we have weekly meetings with the whole exec team. And if I want to launch a product and everybody says, we don't really believe in that product, you know, I'm not going to say let's do it because I believe in it, right? It's, it's, it's all about kind of um, working together. And it was the same when I was CEO at, at Remo, you know, you can't just uh, make decisions by, by yourself because um, there's just too many variables in the business that each and every, every person has their own expertise on. Looking at LVMH more generally, um, obviously it's a massive international conglomerate with um, dozens of, well, I know you don't like to call them luxury brands, but people would sort of perceive them as, as luxury brands um, within it. Do you think that luxury brands um, are mainly purchased as status symbols rather than appreciations of craftsmanship and what connotation do you think this has for the business model of LVMH companies? Sure. So I, I disagree with that statement you know obviously there's all, there will always be this uh, the, the people that want to buy uh, logos or whatever to flex as you, as you were you were saying right but um, I think you know what differentiates us to a lot of other brands is craftsmanship quality and uh, entrepreneurial spirit and investment level right like if, if you walk into a Vuitton store, a Tiffany store, a Dior store, you'll find products that were made by hand with exquisite materials that took, you know, weeks or years sometimes to design, to master, and, and, and that, you know, you, you don't buy this just to show off. I think you buy this because you, it's, A, it's an investment usually, you know. Yes, there are some pr products that are priced lower, but most products are, are very expensive. So, you know, when you spend that amount of money, it's for something that, you know, will be durable, that, you know, you will like and enjoy, m I, I believe, much more to show off. At least that's the kind of clients that we, we uh, interact with, you know, or sometimes, you know, we sell super expensive pieces of jewelry at Tiffany that people are, don't necessarily want to wear because they're too expensive, they're scared, but they like to look at them, put them in their house because they understand stones or metals and appreciate craftsmanship. And sometimes necklaces take three years to make, you know, three years of work for three craftsmen. That's all they do for three years, you know? So, I mean, that, that has to have some appreciation uh, within, within the clients. And, and I think that's definitely something that uh, differentiates us to a lot of comp competitors. Really high-end products like those pieces of jewelry that you were just mentioning. Um, in the sort of old world, even 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, where luxury products were the sole domain of um, areas of limited real estate like Harrods um, and a limited pool of uh, ultra wealthy people, it was very easy for LVMH and LVMH companies to control the market. Do you think that the, that has changed and the desirability of um, ultra high end products has changed with the eruption of e-commerce, of social media, and with the increased 
rapidly changing trends that we see in the 21st I, I, century? I, I think so. I think today access is much easier, whether it's first-hand products, second-hand products, you know, even now like drops that will sell out from any brand you can find on resale marketplaces. So access is much easier thanks to the internet, thanks to social media. Um, I do believe that physical retail remains very important. You know, we just opened a new Dior store in Paris um, last month, which is probably the most extraordinary luxury store in the world. We, you know, took three years to build it and, and invested a lot of money into it. And it, there's alliance in front of the store every day, you know, so you could think that e-commerce revolutionized shopping. People still want to go in and, and be treated with white gloves and, you know, try on jackets and, and taste or feel leather. Um, so I think a combination of both is, is where the world is going. Um, Amazon definitely made shopping super easy, you know, two clicks, it's great, but shop, going shopping on a weekend and, and strolling down, you know, Fifth Avenue or Avenue Montaigne on, on a Saturday on a, on, a, on a great day is an experience you can't really replace uh, online. So um, we're really investing heavily into both areas to make sure that we can be wherever our clients want us to be. And for us, luxury is exactly this, you know, giving our clients what they want. How do you think LVMH can retain its current level of relevance in the coming decades? That's a question to ask to 160,000 people, you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, I think continuing to be at the forefront of creativity, of innovation and craftsmanship is exactly how we can stay relevant. And we're trying to do, we're trying to do so always hiring the most cutting edge designers, um, opening in the most fashion forward places, um, buying brands that are on the market that are, uh, you know, uh, very desirable and, and building upon that is, is for us uh, how we think we can stay relevant. You know, we don't have a recipe, right? It's year after year after year uh, of, of creative processes across different industries, but this is definitely what we're trying to do. Um. You've worked at Tiffany for um, about, about a year now and you're clearly really enjoying it and getting your sort of teeth into various projects. Are there any LVMH companies that you really look at and think, I want to work there someday? I'm focused on Tiffany right now. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a <laughs> diplomatic there's answer. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to do. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, we, I, I, I try not to look ahead too much and, and really focus on what I'm doing. Same in my previous job at Remo, I was really like trying to make sure that I'm, I'm building the most desirable brand and what I'm doing and then opportunities come for sure. Um, again, a bit less of a sort of serious question, but do you find yourselves mainly wearing, eating, drinking um, LVMH brands? Yes, though not today, you know, I think <laughs> those are not LVMH shoes, but I, I, I tend to do so for sure. For do sure. you have a favorite? Tiffany? No. <laughs> Too easy? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I should have expected that one. No. Um, I suppose looking more at the, the, the brand, the, the, the conglomerate nature of it, do you think that having multinational conglomerations of dozens and dozens of brands is healthy for the business world? So for us and for luxury, I do think it is very healthy for a few reasons. Um, one, there's a lot of synergies that can be built between different brands, which you couldn't have if you were an independent. I think a lot of independent brands now struggle because of the space that we or Kering or Richemont, the kind of three large uh, luxury conglomerates take. And so for smaller brands to develop themselves, it's way quicker and easier to do so within a conglomerate. You know, if I look at Remoa also, for example, without LVMH, I don't know how the company would have weathered through COVID, you know, like nobody was traveling or buying a suitcase for two years. So, you know, we kept every single employee. We didn't give any pay downgrades. We paid everyone uh, every month. And, and that's because of the power of a group like LVMH that we could do so and take losses. And now, you know, all the competitors were discounting their products, closing stores, not paying their partners or, or suppliers. We didn't do all, any of that. And now we're ready. Now that travel's picking up again, it's, you know, booming again. So having a group like LVMH and conglomerate helped us uh, to, to do so. Then I also think that for creativity, it's amazing because having a conglomerate like this allows people to, like I said, go from a brand to another, but also across different um, industries. So we often have people that go from wines and spirits to fashion or to jewelry to perfumes and that applies creative minds and creative brains to total different industries and problems which 
in my view, are beneficial to the industry as a whole because you know, you're, you're applying what you learned in different areas to something new that needs this level of creativity to, to grow. Um, <coughs> sorry, just some water. Um, a question, I suppose, then, about the consequence of having such a, a large uh, conglomerate. Obviously, your, your father is a, a very wealthy man, um, and lots of his contemporaries in the world of very wealthy men um, are well known for what, what they do with their money, be it buy other large companies or go to space or whatever else. Do you believe that... I want to go to space, yes. <laughs> um, do you believe that people with individuals at that level of wealth have certain responsibilities to the global community? Um, and do you think it is irresponsible to use that wealth in, in the manner that some of um, some individuals do? Sure. Not your father. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't been to space um, <laughs> that I know of. No, so, so it, you know, it's not my place to talk about what people do with their money, obviously. Uh, it's, but you know, when it comes to my family, one thing that's important to us is you see a lot of numbers in Forbes and all these places and, and a lot of people think that it's a big bag of cash under, under a bed somewhere. The truth is all of this is invested into the business, right? It's all into shares that we've never sold, that we'll never share, that we'll never sell. Um, and it's, it's invested into growing the business, hiring more people, opening plants, investing into countries. You know, I think we, we, we hire 10 or 15,000 people every two or three years. We open plants around the world, we acquire companies, we do a lot of things um, with this. So, so obviously we have a big responsibility, which we're, we're trying to um, live with and, and, and do things with that. But you know, the money is, is invested in, into the company and, and not planning to uh, be used to go to space or do any other things. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question before we hand over to questions from our audience. Um, but you, you are in a room, supposedly, of, of future world leaders in, in various fields. Um, at least that's what the Oxford Union tries to sell itself on. Um, in a world in which leaders of um, in politics, in business, in finance are becoming older and older, what advice do you have for uh, young people trying to enter into the world of, of business and, and finance, as you did at quite a young age? Yeah. I think be curious. For me, curiosity is, is one of the most important virtues uh, one can have and being interested in a lot of different areas of life from business to science to whatever. Two, and that's not common, is be street smart. I think one of the things I value the most in, in people when I hire them is the street smartness. And, and I learned that from being at Remoa, you know, joining a company that was already super big in sales, but that had basically zero infrastructure. You know, I, where you hire 40 year olds that are doing things that they were doing when they were 22 and, and that allows you to be super um, uh, polyvalent, polyvalent as you say in French, I don't know the word in English, but work in different areas um, and be very flexible. And then I think, you know, uh, what's also super important um, is to do what you love. You know, it's a very boring thing, but uh, I think not be forced to follow a path because it's a path that people set for you. But I always feel like people are much better in what they do when, when you can feel that they love what they do. And, and you know, at Remoa, I always like to tell people, if you don't like traveling, don't join the company because we're selling suitcases. And I want you to want to travel on the weekends so you can give me feedback. And same for Tiffany, like you have to like jewelry, whether you know, you're a middle-aged man or a young woman getting married and who wants a diamond ring or whatever it is, you know, I think it's, it's the love for the product uh, is, is what's the most important to us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank I'm you sure very much. I've had enough of my questions. Um, so if any of you have any questions for Alexander, please put your um, hands up. The member in the front row to my right. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for that interview. It was really, really interesting. Um, oh, wait, stand up. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I thought, I thought it was really interesting what you said about kind of reaching out to future generations and you know, remaining pertinent to kind of new customer bases and people who are interested in 
um, upcoming trends and so on. Um, some of what your work has involved around, for example, you know, your NFT launches, for example, the TIFF coin, that also has pertinence to some of the things we're organising at the Oxford Union. We're doing like a debate on the metaverse in a couple of weeks and so on too. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you, like as, you know, quite a young, relatively young um, CEO, how do you kind of balance that contemporary energy and that kind of eye to innovation with retaining the traditions which um, you know Tiffany and LVMH more generally holds and sort of stemming from that um, what kind of trends and so on would you recommend people who young people like us who are interested in kind of the fashion and art industry to keep in mind going forwards but yeah thank you sure so so first part um, you know Keeping a balance between tradition and modernity is the essence of, of what we're trying to do, you know, and it's always the balance of super, like, you know, super traditional um, trunk making at Vuitton linked to Nike sneakers made by Virgil that are very futuristic. You know, it, it's, it's all about balancing everything that we're trying to do the best we can, you know, so far it's working. So we're, we're, we're very lucky and, and, and uh, fortunate for that, but um, that's, that's definitely been kind of the essence of what all, our, all of our brands do. As for new trends, you know, I'm not going to say the metaverse because everybody's bored by that already. And I think there, there's, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and, and easy things that are, are said in there. But I do think that um, new communities are, are trends that are extremely exciting for um, fashion, art, and other areas. Um, because, you know, for us, we come from a world where 30 years ago, the only way you could give your message to people was by taking the back page of Vogue magazine and you would tell like, hey, this is my brand, this is who I am, and you don't have a say to it. Now with Instagram, Twitter, and, and TikTok and everything, like you can still give this message, but people can comment, tweet, reshare, talk about it, trash, love, and build communities around this, right? And so. Um, getting access to these communities and understanding how they work is very important, in my view, to grow businesses organically in a way that's community-led versus super authoritarian like it was in the past. And I don't think it's contrarian to um, building a brand in a, in a kind of like very cold mindset, but it's, it's important to be a part of this. And so I think it applies to art, NFTs, metaverse, a lot of a lot of uh, c categories. Thank you very much. That's a big help. Um, thank you. Um, now we move to the next question. The honourable member in the floral dress on the front row. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for sharing your insights with us. Um, my uh, the focus of my uh, DFIL research is on loyalty and what drives really truly loyal behavior. Now, a lot of luxury brands focus very much on transactional loyalty. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask you, since arriving at Tiffany, you mentioned that you sort of brought a new long-term vision to the company. Have you brought in sort of a new um, vision of loyalty and a new approach to loyalty? And can you share that with us? Sure. So it's a very interesting question and loyalty is obviously the, the most important or one of the most important metrics that we track uh, in our businesses, right? It's repeat business as, as, as we call it in a very um, transactional way, as you're saying. It's early to talk about new ways of loyalty. However, I do think that um, the arrival of social media and se cell phones basically allowed customers to have a much more privileged relationship to brands because in a, in, in a former world, you could live in a place where there's no store in the three hours around from you and you would have to literally drive to the store to, to get access to something. Now, you can talk to a sales representative on WhatsApp or whatever you want and you're able in that way to create a relationship between you and the brand that is completely personalized to who you are. And you know, you will, will wish you a happy birthday and will know kind of what you're looking for because of what you've spent in the past or if you're whatever, getting married, having children or God knows what part of your life you're at. And then we're able to talk and target, talk to you and target you in a way that's much more personalized, which is also not driven by Salesforce or like CRM kind of softwares, but is, is human driven, right? And so all about relationships. And I feel like this has been a big part of what we've been trying to drive in, in consumption at Tiffany or at other brands, in other brands of the group, um, which has had a lot of success. Because then if you feel emotionally connected to the company and you, you actually have someone to talk to, you know, you can 
you know something's coming out, you, you ask for it in advance and things like that, and, and it, it drives a lot more repeat business, loyalty, and, and um, excitement between you and, and, and the brand, for sure. Thank you very much. If my sister's um, carefully curated display of light blue boxes is anything to go by, I think Tiffany's doing quite a good job <laughs> of, 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 of um, loyalty. Um, the uh, other member in the front row, yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, what are your key priorities for Tiffany going forward? And if we think in five years' time, what excites you the most about the brand? And if you think about what Tiffany can bring to the broader watches and jewelry division at LVMH, um, what, what would you highlight there? And similarly, what learnings can you take from the other brands in the group, maybe the acquisition of Bulgari? Thank mm -hmm. you. So five years from now um, is a long time. We're, um, our priorities are, are to grow the business in a very, um, organic way and desirable way you know uh, tiffany is one of the most well-known brands uh, in the world in the u.s especially um, we know that and we're, we're trying to make it regain desirability that it had in the past that it could have lost a little bit and you know little by little all initiatives you're seeing us do uh, since a year and a half now um, has been to go through this path so it's it's really desirability first then i think product is very important to us you know we 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 have four product categories, basically, you know, I'm not going to bore you with details, but it's silver jewelry, gold jewelry, um, engagement jewelry, and high jewelry, you know, and so all areas uh, have different priorities per se and are, are growing uh, themselves in a way that we want to make sure that craftsmanship and quality is maintained and, and even higher going forward, regardless of category, whether it's a $180 trinket or a $200,000 necklace, um, so regardless of price point and, and, and category. Um, when it comes to engagement jewelry, it's also very interesting, right, because it's a, it's a more macro business unit, right, like the less weddings, the less people are going to buy uh, wedding rings, so, so the world, people are getting married less and less, other than this year because there were two years without weddings, but like the trends are, are decreasing, so it's, it's more of a, a market share gain than a pure kind of product innovation because a diamond ring is, is, is a diamond ring, you know, in, in, in the end. So then new categories also is, is very important to us. You know, we used to be the reference for tableware, for accessories, for example, which we still do, but in a way that's not as successful as it used to be. So we're in the plan of relaunching that in, in the next few months. Um, watches also, you know, a lot of people talk about the Patek Philippe watches that we, we sell, which are great, but they're, they're not Tiffany made, you know, they, they're made in the, in, in the Patek Philippe watch uh, factories. So we're, we're definitely super interested in that category um, too. What can it bring to the watch and jewelry division of LVMH? Well, it's the largest brand now. So whatever it brings, you know, it shows quickly because um, it's, it's the largest acquisition in luxury and it's the largest brand by far in, in the division uh, of the group. So learnings, buying power, synergies are, are, are very important of, of what we can bring in that end, you know, when it comes to buying diamonds or things like that. Bulgari is another interesting story. What it taught us was that you know, we didn't know a lot about the jewelry business before because we were very fashion driven and, and Bulgari taught us to be patient, which um, is uh, one of the few things that I am not. Uh, and like I said earlier, you know, designers come into a fashion brand, three months later you have a new collection and things can just shift like this. Jewelry takes a lot more time. So it, it taught us to be patient and I think, you know, we were able to make decisions like these which were not too rushed, which we could have done a little bit in the beginning at Bulgari because we didn't know the industry as well. Um, just to maintain kind of growth also and, and not take too drastic decisions that could have been um, uh, not the right ones to make. For example, you know, discontinuing product lines. I heard a lot of people say when we bought the company, like, oh, they're going to stop silver because it's not expensive and you know, it's not at all what we're planning to do uh, what, what, what whatsoever, uh, which we can do now by, by understanding patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, I, the, the member in the second row here. Hi. Um, you mentioned um, class prepa and all that kind of thing. I was just wondering, we're at Oxford. If you give us an insight into what it, life, student life was like at uh, the Ecole Polytechnique and if you think it resembles kind of British student life, Oxford or American student life, etc. 
so I've just spent one hour in Oxford in my whole life, which is this hour. So, <laughs> so uh, no, what I can tell you about Classe Prépa for sure is um, uh, from 18 to 20 years old, basically when you graduate high school, you go to these very generalist um, science uh, classes, which are, you know, math, physics, chemistry, a little bit of English and like literature that we do. And, and it's, it's a competition with an age group of people that go, uh, against you and the first so after these two years of intense studying and when I say intense it's very very intense um, the first 15 get into the best school the next 15 get into the best school it's etc etc all in a super anonymous way as, as I mentioned uh, earlier unlike Oxford where I feel like when you come here and correct me if I'm wrong but you can kind of choose what you want to study um, in class prepa you can choose if you want to do scientific or business focused but then you're kind of all in the same boat and shaken 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 in the same boat and you can only specialize much later so i started studying computer science when i was 22 you know until i was 22 i was just doing math physics chemistry like all my other classmates at this we're learning the same things um, it's academically very difficult you know i hated my, my parents for letting me do that but now i'm very grateful because it teaches you a lot of things like hard work and effort and that you can't learn anywhere else at that age, to, to, to be honest, especially, you know, like me coming from a very privileged background, like the only thing that talks in the end is, is your result of the exam. So was it fun? Was student life fun eventually once like the academics? It wasn't, it wasn't super fun. <laughs> no, no. And, and the thing is also like it's the one broken thing of the French system, you know, I don't know how to unbreak it, is that like you have these two or three years, two years for the most smart, three for the less smart, I did three, uh, of class prépa that are very, very intense. And then once you get into the school, after this competition, you know, you, you get your results, whatever, like in July, you have the best summer of your life. Um, the school is kind of laid back. You know, you don't, like, I remember when I arrived, I came from a world where I would go to school from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then study till midnight every day for three years to having a day and a half of classes and the rest of the time just like just do whatever you know so I, I was I started working immediately because I, I was bored you know but it's it's kind of a big disconnect between what you do once you're inside the school that's the prestigious thing to do versus when you're when you're in the class prepa so I really think the class prepa is the the, um, the real training program that you can get um, I like to remember the, the, the back in the Hawaiian shirt Thank you for being here. Um, I'm curious about your experience uh, going through this transaction and then now leading the company with the background of COVID and now what are very much so unprecedented um, issues of supply chains, globalization, you know, all sorts of other, you know, war ongoing right now, things that really haven't happened in uh, your and <laughs> lifetime. Uh, and then also just are quite circumstantially different from, from the past and kind of what experiences you've had um, in your working career up to this point and then also uh, that helped you through that and then also what you've kind of learned from the last two and a half years in that environment sure so um super disturbed times you know when i when i joined tiffany in january of last year um, for the first three months there was no offices um, i didn't meet a single person face by face um, and i had to assess who was doing a good job not a good job who was doing what all over zoom which People think that young people love Zoom. I hate Zoom. You know? <laughs> it, was, it was extremely, extremely difficult to understand and, and make right decisions like these and review products and designs and campaigns all behind the screen. So that's the first very like um, pragmatic impact that it had on the acquisition from joining the company. Then the US was closed to the world for the first 12 months when I was there. So you know, nobody could come either talents or anything you wanted to do. You, know, you couldn't get out of the country or in the country because of the border closures, which was a huge uh, difficulty to, to run the business um, in, in a good way. Um, then, you know, obviously supply chain is, is a huge issue for everyone. So, you know, I, I could go on and on about shipments of diamonds and gold and materials that are not getting in time or, or things like that. But I think everybody's facing that. So, so it's, it's less... Um, 
proper to what we did uh, at Tiffany. I think the fact that the acquisition happened right in the middle of COVID um, is definitely something that was the most disrupting to running the business, um, for sure. Then, you know, I think it's um, the street smartness that I, I was talking about earlier is, is what allows the company and, and us to make decisions that can help you grow and go quicker in uncertain environments, in environments where, you know, you haven't never experienced it before. Hopefully you'll never experience them uh, again. You know, you were asking for the last two and a half years. I remember in, in March of 2020, I was CEO of Ramoa and we were talking about COVID a little bit and then the borders closed from a day to another and we were selling suitcases. So we're like, okay, what's going to happen? Like we have 2,300 factory workers. We're building thousands of suitcases a year, uh, a day. Like what's going to happen to demand? Are we supposed to close the factories, let go of people? And it's, it's, it's very, very day by day. And then all that with lockdowns and, and, and things where you don't expect um, your business to be run uh, this way ever. But, you know, it's just day by day you take it and you try to make the, the, the right decisions that, that you can for the, for the business. We have time for probably one or two more questions. Uh, the member in the black jumper in the second row on my right. Hi, um, how do you think the popularity of fast fashion and increasingly short trend cycles and younger demographics impacts com companies like Tiffany who focus on the quality of their craft over the speed of production? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think, uh, and again, I'm not going to talk bad about uh, fast fashion or, or, or competitors. I do think that it's a completely different business model that we have. You know, we, we don't view ourselves at all as fast cycles, fast, fast cycle companies, even if our fashion brands, you know, do six, eight collections a year sometimes. Um, everything is done with the utmost creativity. We never copy uh, anyone, you know, which I think a lot of fast fashion companies tend to do just for the sake of being fast. Um, and, and I think, you know, as long as we stay creative, we stay at the heart of what we do best, hopefully we'll stay successful. So, so we, we really don't really look at this, this industry too much because um, it's just a different business. It's just like if you were asking me if what I thought of food delivery, it's a great business, right? But like, it doesn't have a lot to do with, with what we do um, given the business model, um, even if you know, we share a lot of customers. A lot of customers shop at Tiffany and also shop at fast fashion companies or you know, get food delivered in their houses. So it's, it's, it's an ecosystem of, of, of people that we share, but we don't work the same way at all. Thank you. Um, next question, please. Uh, the member in the red coat in the front right here. Oh. Oh, I said the member in the red coat, so, sorry. <laughs> you can go next, sir. <laughs> Very disciplined. <Yeah. laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for coming. It's been such an interesting um, yeah, talk and everything, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the Petsak and um watch, and obviously LVMH has been behind some incredibly high demand products like the like Dior Air Jordan or the Supreme Ramoa suitcases that have all like, that are all like reselling at inflated prices. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on this like massive inflation on the resale market and the resale market more generally and what LVMH's approach is um, in that regard, especially as like one of the criticism that it can be is that it takes away, you know, the opportunity like to, from loyal customers to shop. Um, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, so a, a, a few things. I think um, the inflation on the resale market for us is a matter of supply and demand. You know, you have this in every industry, whether it's you know, a company going public and the stock soaring on the first day because supply and demand are, are not um, uh, equal. We try not to look at it too much, uh, even if a lot of people are, are excited about it. Um, when, so the resale market is very new. It's like whatever, five, seven years old. Before that, it was much easier. Now, the first few collaborations we made, it was difficult to understand how we could allocate pieces to people, right? Because you want to please your loyal customers. You want to give a chance to everyone also to become a new customer and not having to be a customer for eight years to get access to this product. So it took a little bit of learning. I think every brand does it differently, but the way I view it is, is kind of a combination of both. You know, whenever you know that you're doing a limited 
quantity product that you feel is going to be successful, A, it's not always successful, but when it is and the resale value skyrockets, we try to sell it to a combination of people who are loyal customers and new customers to make sure that you know, we can be fair and equitable to, to everyone. That being said, you know, products like the Patek Philippe, for example, are completely disproportionate, right? Because you can buy it for, I think, 50 or $60,000 and it's sold for 6 million. So we're, that's like a real, real money present you can make to someone. So we're trying to also find people who we know actually want the product and not want the asset, if it makes sense, because they consider this as an asset, right? And we sell products in craftsmanship and quality. We don't sell options or derivatives or things like that, right? So, so we really try to make sure that every client we pick to buy those products, whether they're loyal or new, we give them like an interview or a vetting or a background check of some sort to make sure that, you know, it's going into the right hands. We make mistakes all the time. You know, you'll see these products on a resale website at auction all the time, but we try to do it the least we can. Great, thank you so much. Very quickly then, the gentleman in the blue jacket. Last question, I'm afraid, sorry. Hi, Arslan Kareem, co-founder of Clearnova. I did check with my friend for his question. I think I have a better one, so I thought ah. I'll stick to mine. Um, which brand that you presently don't own would you really like to acquire? And what <laughs> is it in those brands that you think would make it a good fit for LVMH? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I can't really answer that question. I'm sorry, because, you know, public markets and... and, and um, Twitter. <laughs> maybe the second or, part or, or um, Tesla you know yeah. <laughs> it depends maybe the second part of the question what do you look for in, the, in, in a brand that really gives it an LVMH stamp something like yeah that? sure I think you know what we look at is um, the core values of, of the company which is the ones that we shared in the beginning quality craftsmanship and strong DNA you know we, we, we don't want to buy um, acquire gimmicky brands. We want to acquire brands that have been, you know, here for a long time, uh, that are proven, that have proven to be successful at some point in time. It doesn't have to be, you know, the hottest brand of the moment, but brands that we believe we can also continue to grow along the lines of extraordinary product in terms of quality, craftsmanship, with a very strong DNA. I think more and more also we look at, now that we're so large, we look at barriers to entry to make sure that we're not buying another fashion brand that's going to compete with all the other fashion brands we have but you know we would acquire a fashion brand that had strong strong barriers to entry uh, um, compared to the others that has a different value pro value proposition for for customers as well um, yeah i think those are the key things that we look at and then obviously you know financial performance is important for us uh, also but that really comes at the end Thanks. Um, I did follow your work at Remover and I did buy a suitcase. I think you did a, a great job. Great. So. great. Buy another one. I've actually, <laughs> I've actually, since you left, I'm switching to Globetrotter. So um, something, uh, something's not working there right now. So. You're switching to Globetrotter? Yeah. Why? I think they have better innovation, better design, and Interesting. Better, Wait, well, better product. Well, if it breaks, you know, don't call me. Go back to Remover. <laughs> But before we finish, two quick questions from me. One that we ask all our speakers and one that I'm just personally curious about. Um, we'll start with the latter. Um, diamonds. As uh, somebody obviously works at Tiffany, you must work with lots of diamonds. Do you have a preference between natural diamonds and synthetic diamonds? Uh, and which would you a, choose that's and why? A, that's a great question, which I'm, I'm surprised no one has asked for now because it's, it's very, very... Um, in the moment. So we, we don't sell um, lab-grown diamonds at Tiffany. We have a very clear view, um, and, and I, I share this view, that we, we believe strongly in, in natural diamonds for a few reasons. One, it's a part of history. You know, they take millions, thousands of years to be created in, inside of Earth, and it's a beautiful um, stone and product that has hours of craftsmanship also once it's found, you know. Um, then two, I think, the story also of the diamond, you know, you, you can buy a diamond for yourself or for someone you want to give it to, you know, and, and would you rather own something that has been a part of the planet forever, almost forever, or that has been done in a microwave somewhere? You know, I can't answer that for you. I know the answer for myself. And then I think a couple of things also that are, are, are to note, 
Um, number one is that the diamond industry um, is very present in Africa. If the lab-grown diamond industry would take over the natural diamond industry, I think you put 13 or 14 million people out of work in Africa. And that could create extraordinary unrest that I don't see why you should create it. And then two, I think one of the things that's super important in diamonds is ethical diamonds, you know. And at Tiffany, we proud ourselves to say that since 30 or 35 years, since we can, um, every single diamond is sourced in the most ethical way. And when we sell you a diamond, we'll know where it was found, who found it, how much that person was paid, uh, who they were working for, where it was cut, et cetera, et cetera, because we really um, value ethical sourcing and ethical journey towards the diamond from end to end. So, you know, once you have those criteria that are met, which, you know, we, we proud ourselves to meet, I think, you know, natural diamonds are the way to go, for sure. And finally, a question we ask all of our speakers. In two or three sentences, um, what advice would you give to the members of the Oxford Union and the members of Oxford University more generally going forwards in life? In general, in yes. life? Yes, two of sentences, in <laughs> life, anything, <laughs> any advice. Um, um, <clears throat> Kind of what I said earlier, you know, so be curious, listen to what you love more than to what people tell you, even if, you know, what you studied um, is what you're studying. I studied engineering and, and ended up, you know, working in diamond industry or jewelry industry, which has nothing to do with each other. So uh, I would encourage you to do the same thing um, and have fun along the way also, because I just turned 30 last week, you know, so my 20s are gone forever and, and uh, it happens. It, go, it comes by. My 27th started yet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that makes you feel old. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And join me. Thank you very much. Thank you.